well, um, six lectures always feels incredibly short. Uh, with, with such a small number of lectures, of course, uh, one, one always has a choice. You can go into depth about all of the different types of um, phenomena we might discover at the Large Hadron Collider and talk about the various models that people have invented over the years, the things that might lie beyond the standard model, or what can sort of go through and uh, get an, an overview of the physics of, of this machine and the context in which it sits. And uh, my, my tendency is always to try to cover things in a class like this that you won't get in your other classes. Because, I mean, you know, there's particle physics courses you can take, and there's monocular courses you can take, and it, but, but there's always things that get left out. So I try to cover the stuff that nobody says, or nobody organizes in the, in, in the same way. I always take, take an idiosyncratic view of the subject. So that's what I'm going to give you. Um, I have given lectures somewhat like this before, but they were all before the Higgs was discovered, so obviously that introduces some, some differences. And one of the things I will cover, uh, after sort of laying out the background of the LHC and then go starting to go into some of the details about the things you need to know to understand how this machine works and what we can do there. Uh, I will go through the discovery of the Higgs. I mean, after all, it's, it's pretty neat. <laughs> and um, also the searches, some of the searches that are being done for other things. We'll see how, how much time I have for that. But I think anytime you look at how the experimentalists have actually searched for something, you will discover there's about seven or eight things that you didn't know about how people actually do these experiments. And as theorists, well, honestly, young theorists tend to have a pretty naive view about how hard it is to do these experiments. There's a tendency to think, okay, we're the theorists. Yeah, the experiments, they just go and they measure. Unless you, especially in a hadron machine, if you are naive about how these experiments are done, you will misunderstand all sorts of things. Very, very complicated very subtle, these people are very clever, and you need to understand and appreciate just what they're doing. So part of the purpose of this course is to make sure you do that. But let's start with theory, because after all, the experiment was designed based on a theoretical question. Here's the standard model. Amazingly simple theory, in a way. You have a certain set of fields, you write down the normalizable Lagrangian that's consistent with those fields, and the only thing that you can write down are kinetic terms for the gauge fields, the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge fields, kinetic terms for the fermions involving covariant derivatives, remember covariant derivative will always involve ordinary derivative and then a coupling to each of the gauge fields under which the fermion is charged, with the coupling constant of the gauge field appearing there. The only place the gauge couplings appear is in those covariant derivatives. And of course, the Higgs, which is a similar covariant derivative, it has potential. And then finally, we have the couplings of the Higgs and the fermions that give us the fermion masses in the end. That's it. Well, it's almost it. We do know that neutrinos have mass, so we have to throw in the extra terms that uh, uh, Gino mentioned yesterday. Um, but uh, partly because the scale that would be associated with these. This is, this is a, uh, since it's not normalizable, there's some scales, higher, higher mass scale associated with this interaction. Uh, this scale is quite high, and neutrinos are hard to measure, and so forth. This doesn't come in much for collider physics of the sort we'll be talking about. So this term is there, don't forget it, but we will not really uh, have many opportunities to see it. Everything else, every term here, plays a role at the large power collider in what we're <coughs> Now, as of 2008, before we turned on the machine, and really going back to, let's say, 1995, when the top part was discovered, everything about this was known except for one thing. Right? In particular, we knew that uh, this is a good model for what we knew about nature. Of course, there could be something more complicated, but this was the sort of minimal set of, or the minimal Lagrangian we write down, which was consistent with all known, with all known experiments. 
as long as you said that H had an expectation value of V of 246 GDP. And you could have stopped there. You could have just said H is equal to V, and there's no dynamics associated with it. And ask yourself, well, okay, consistent with all experiments, do I actually have to say that there's a Higgs <coughs> part? Well, field theory would tell you there should be something, but you know, are you sure? Maybe we just need some constant, and that's good enough. And the problem, as uh, Raman has told you, and perhaps others have mentioned it as well, is that the theory without that H excitation has a unitarity problem. Or you can say it in various, various different ways. It is, it, what it really has is an energy growth problem. That if you imagine the scattering of two W bosons, that grows with energy, and it grows fast enough that at some point the answer doesn't make any sense. The probability for scattering W bosons, the probability for two W bosons to scatter at least formally gets bigger than one. Well, what that really means is that the perturbative calculation is breaking down, so there must be some other physics that you have to add in to fix it. And the simplest thing you can add in to solve this problem <coughs> is H, a physical particle which appears in the WW scattering diagram. And not putting in all the diagrams, but at least the critical diagram. <coughs> it's the presence of this field, of this particle, in this chapter which resolves this problem. If the H isn't there, or even more precisely, if it's there but heavier than about a TeV, 800 GeV perhaps, then this graph by itself has grown with energy enough that the rate for WW scattering has been enough formally, which means you need something else. So this theory just doesn't make sense if you, have, if you don't have something like this below 800 GeV. So the unitary problem is really a problem. What that means is if you build a machine with sufficient energy, you're either going to find an H, or maybe multiple H's, because maybe this hydrogen isn't quite right, has more structure to it, or there's got to be something else you add to the Lagrangian, because this Lagrangian by itself can't be the full story. There has to be some other dynamics that you add in. Maybe not a particle, but maybe some new forces. Something, some new interactions. I don't know what. But what we knew in 1995 was that in the absence of an H, this is an inconsistent theory. There must be something else. And a machine that can probe the TV scale will give us sensitivity to that. And one of the main reasons is you can actually do WW scattering. Not easy at the LHC. Remember how this is done? It's actually quark quark scattering. The W's come off, and somehow they come out again. And as Raman mentioned, what you're really looking for is the scattering of the longitudinal W's. It's the longitudinal component of the W's which has this large energy growth. And it's not surprising because the longitudinal part of the W's are the components of H, which are the Goldstone modes, in, uh, which would be the Goldstone modes of H if there were no gauge interactions. They're the things that got eaten by the W's to give the W's mass. And those are the things which, if the little h isn't there, kind of wonder, what's my Lagrangian? What is the interaction of these Goldstone modes if there isn't an h around? Because if there isn't an h around, it can't be as simple as this. It must be something more complicated. It's a nonlinear interaction. OK, so the unitary problem tells you there is physics that we don't know at or below the TV scale. Period. Separately, there's the hierarchy problem. The hierarchy problem is a very different type of problem. In fact, it's not necessarily even a problem. It simply says that, well, as always, just any good problem has 10 different ways to look at it. So let me give you another way to look at it if it's different from what Raman was saying. You can think of it as a problem of dimensional analysis. We all know in physics, dimensional analysis is a way of guessing answers. Uh, 
typically, you, in, any, in any simple problem you work on in quantum mechanics class or in freshman in your first year of undergraduate physics, you can just guess the answer if you're in science, right? You, you just you, you look at the problem, you look at the uh, quantities that you've got, you write down the answer, and then there's a coefficient you don't know that you actually have to calculate. But everything except that coefficient you just know, because there's only one form the answer could take, and that coefficient is generally one or a half or seven or twelve. But not 10 to the minus 32. Now, in quantum mechanics, dimensional analysis works really well. Because, well, maybe in classical mechanics, you could set something up so that, you know, somehow you arrange the problem that there's some funny cancellation. But then quantum corrections to that, if it's a quantum mechanics problem, we're generally going to be of a sort that that ruins the cancellation and things are going to come out that we expect. When experience shows. When in quantum mechanics, dimensional analysis fails, there's usually a very good reason that you can identify. So let's apply that to the standard model. Here's the standard model Lagrangian. What are the quantities that go into this Lagrangian? Well, almost everything here is dimensionless. That's a parameter, it's dimensionless. The hollow couplings are dimensionless. The gauge couplings are dimensionless. So this thing should be order one. Well, everything here is of order one, except, well, the electron mass is kind of small. Right? The gauge couplings are about, you know, are within factor of 10 of 1. This is within about a factor of 10 of 1, uh, looking ahead. Um, and most of these, well, the top part, the cow coupling is 1. And then the bottom part, you're already down at, just to get to 10 to minus 2. By the time you get to the electron, it's 10 to minus 5. Huh. So those are small. Why does dimension analysis not work there? Well, the point is, quantum mechanics can't fix this because there's a symmetry in the limit that the coupling constant is zero. That's chiral symmetry. If the electron mass was zero, that is, if the chiral coupling for the electron were zero, it remains zero in all quantum corrections because there's an extra symmetry in that limit. So to say, to say that um, in a more formal sense, uh, dimensional analysis says that the change in the <laughs> mass, you know, why is it that one? Chiral symmetry says, ah, it's because the change in electron mass is proportional to the electron mass. So the correction for the electron mass is order one, not the, but the, if, well, let me say, I'm sorry, let me say one thing first. That says that the correction to the Kawa coupling. From the point of view, this, this, is a, this is a statement which you might make at low energy. From the point of view of this Lagrangian, which is the full Lagrangian of the theory, what it's really saying is the Yukawa coupling of the electron gets a correction proportional to the Yukawa coupling of the electron. So if it's 10 to the minus 5, maybe it becomes 2 times 10 to the minus 5 after corrections. But it can't go from 10 to the minus 5 to 1 if the theory is perturbing, and it is. If it were 0, it would remain 0. So that is why we're allowed to have small power couplings in the standard model, and it's not a problem. Dimensional analysis fails for them because once you set it to fail, it will continue to fail. Those couplings are small, they'll always be small, even counting for quantum corrections. By contrast, this is a dimensionful parameter. This is the only parameter I've mentioned so far. How big should it be? Well, the world has a in it. Gravity is a scale. Why should this scale be much, much smaller than that scale? That's a dimensional analysis problem. Well, you could say, well, maybe there's a symmetry. Maybe, maybe there's a reason why when this is zero, it stays zero. But that's false. The correction to the Higgs mass parameter is not proportional to any zero squared. For example, it gets corrections of order y top squared times some i scale. That doesn't happen here. We get a law. So dimensional analysis works for the Higgs mass parameter and it leaves you with a puzzle. So it should work for the it, it, dimensional analysis ought to work for the Higgs mass parameter, but it doesn't. The Higgs mass parameter is for some reason much, much smaller than you would guess. That's the hierarchy. 
Any questions about that way of thinking about it? Now, in field theory, it could just happen that when you calculate this correction and you add it into, well, not just this correction, but all the corrections, the one loop corrections from all the different particles, and the two loop corrections from all the different particles, the three loop, and so forth, you calculate them all, and you add them to what appears in the bare loop option, the physical Higgs mass is 125 GV. That can happen. It's finely tuned. You've arranged that this term and all the corrections from all the other terms, which involve all the other couplings being just right, are such that in this magical balancing act, out comes this very tiny mass. Can happen. So, it's not an inconsistency of the theory. In contrast to this one. But it's a hint that maybe we're missing something. Raman just gave you a reason why maybe we're not missing anything. Maybe the reason it's so small is because the universe is very diverse, and in all sorts of different parts of the universe, things are different. We live in a very special part of the universe where this is so small because it's the only part of the universe that's habitable. But maybe there's a dynamical explanation, or partly dynamical explanation, which says, well, the reason that this is so small, the reason that, that the physical Higgs mass is so small, is because there's something additional that I've left out. For example, maybe the Higgs is composite. Okay? Then this scale, the ultraviolet scale, is a composite scale, that may be quite low. <clears throat> or maybe the Higgs is related by supersymmetry to a Higgsino, a fermion, which does have a chiral symmetry. And the chiral symmetry that protects the electron mass, similarly, there's a similar chiral symmetry that protects the Higgsino mass, and then the Higgsino mass is related to the Higgs by symmetry, and that protects the Higgs mass. So maybe this formula is not quite right. It relates to this ultraviolet scale to have a supersymmetry breaking scale. Maybe. So these two problems, one a very serious problem, and one a potentially serious problem, but you can't be sure. Give you two motivations, at least, for building a machine which it can access the TEV scale. And because this motivation is a definite, and not, not, a, not a easily maybe question, but a definite problem, you know this machine is worth building. You will learn something. And if you're lucky, and the hierarchy problem is a real problem, you're going to learn a lot. So, if you're back in 1995, or even before, you already know this is something you want to do. You want to aim at this scale. That's the context that we live in. And uh, for, for Raman and myself, we've been living in since we were graduate students. It's been that way. In fact, in a way, it's been that way since Fermi, because once you know the Fermi scale is at the TV, you know there should be something interesting that happens at that scale. We've pushed and pushed and pushed, we haven't found the full answer yet, so you knew, okay, you have to go there. So, um, what sort of machine should you build? How are you going to use it? That's question number one. Um, Well, what are your options? What can we do Technolog technologically? Well, we, can, we know how to accelerate particles. We know how to slam them into things. What particles do we have available to us? Well, they better be stable, because the particle falls apart while you're trying to accelerate it is not very useful. And they better be electrically charged, because the particle that's neutral, you can't steer it. You can't make it go where you want, to, want it to go. You can't accelerate it. So, how many stable charged particles do we have to play with? Electrons, protons, and their antiparticles. And that's it. Not a, bunch, not a lot of options. All right, now, um, 
Let's see. So uh, let's start with electrons and positrons. It'll be easier to think about. They're nice and simple. Um, well, first of all, what can we do with it? You know, if you take a beam of electrons, what can you do with it? We can slam it into a wall, the target. That's easy, right? The target's just sitting there. Why don't we just do that? What's wrong with just taking a single beam and slamming it into something? It seems like a lot of Right, so the problem is that center mass energy, or S, center mass energy squared, S, is the sum of the momenta of the two things, the full momenta of the two things that you <coughs> together, squared, and if one of them is at rest, you get twice E beam times the mass of the target, and that means that the center mass energy goes like the square root of the energy of the beam. Not a very efficient way to get center mass energy. Whereas, so that's the fixed target. But if you have a, um, if you're colliding two beams head on, which is obviously a much more difficult thing to do, you get the full energy. So that's why we do collide physics. Just that reason. It's worth it, because you get the full energy. And energy is what we need, because obviously if you want to make particles, new particles x, and you're setting in an electron and a positron, the mass of the x that you can make is limited by the energy of the beam. And particularly if you want to make Higgs bosons, for example, well actually the efficient way to make those is to use this interaction, the fact that there's this easy Higgs interaction, And um, so, basically that's as far as you can go. And typically, the mass of the things you can produce has to be less than the beam energy, sorry, twice the beam energy, minus mc. Well, you always lose a few GeV here and there, so it's typically a little bit less than that. Let me make a remark before I go on. If I were to observe this, I would know immediately that this is the Higgs, or at least a Higgs, that is say something that gives the Z boson its mass. How do I know that? What's special about that information? So let's take a look at where it comes from. It comes from here, right? That's the only place that the Z and the Higgs interact with each other at all. Um, so in particular, Where does it come from? So this term contains, just like for any scalar, right? There are terms of the form um, dhdh. There are terms of the form zhch. And before the Higgs field has an expectation, and well, then also there's a term uh, dhzh and things like this. I won't write all, all the terms. This this is the form that they have. So there's an interaction of the Z with two Higgses. There's an interaction of, well, this is the propagator for the Higgs. There's an interaction of two Zs with two Higgses. Where did this thing come from? Where did I get that? CH, CH. Okay, I start with this and I do what? H takes an exponential value, then Really, I should have, maybe for consistency, put a little h here, just for, for, so we don't get confused about who's who. If I think of h as the full field, and h is the excitation, little h is the excitation, I'm producing this particle, and that is the excitation of capital H around V, and when I substitute that in here, right, 
If I put a V in both places, the Z gets a mass. If I put it in only one place, I get this interaction. And that's the only way I can get this interaction. It's a completely general state. Take any scalar field, couple it to some gauge field. It's going to have a kinetic term like this. It's going to have terms like this. There will be no interaction of one scalar with two vectors unless the scalar has an expectation value and gives the vector its mass. It comes from taking this term and substituting in something with the vector. You cannot get it any other way. This interaction is the interaction that tells you this is a part of what is giving the z its mass. And in fact, the size of this interaction is directly correlated with what fraction of the z particle's mass is obtained from the Higgs. In particular, if it obtains all of it, there's only one Higgs boson, the z boson gets all of its mass from this term, then what appears here is the weak interaction scale, well, okay, strictly speaking, there's both the Z is a mixture of weak and hypercharge, SU2 cross U1. But roughly speaking, the coupling constant which appears here times the VEV squared, giving the mass of the Z squared. <coughs> and the coupling constant squared times one power of V gives me the strength of this interaction. They're directly linked. So this is a good way to make the Higgs that gives the Z its mass. It's through this interaction. So why don't we just do that? Well, we, we tried. That was called LEP, Large Electron Positron Collider. It sat in the same tunnel that the Large Hadron Collider sits in. And the only problem was the beam energy that they could manage at LEP was 105. Two. Lab one was aimed right at the Z boson, so the mass was the, the beam energy was one half the Z mass. They just sat there and studied the Z boson very carefully. Lab two, they pushed the energy up as far as they could go gradually, looking for this. If you do the calculation in your head, you'll see they came about 10 GV short. The limit that they could obtain on the Higgs boson mass was 115 GV. As we know today, it's just a little bit, a little bit less. Damn. So close. Well, so why don't we just build a bigger electron positron machine? What are the challenges of E plus E minus machines? Well, there's two types of machines that you can build. One is a circle, roughly, a storage ring. and you send your positrons and your electrons around in opposite directions, and they slam into each other. Now, what's nice about this? What's nice about it is, let me be oversimplifying about it first. Um, you take a bunch of positrons, you take a bunch of electrons, and they go, they're going round and round. And you don't have to aim that carefully. Because what you do is you take a huge number of electrons, a huge number of positrons, you kind of aim them, and they pass right through each other. And you just aim enough that the chances are good that one electron is going to hit one positron. And then they go around again, and you do it again. And so you can get many, many collisions. You just put one bunch of each, well, typically you put more than one to be more efficient, but strictly speaking, one will be enough. You have one bunch of these guys, one bunch of those guys, and they just go round and round and round for hours, giving you collisions. So there's a storage phase. You first have to put, you have to accelerate the electrons, you put them in the ring, and then you accelerate the positron, you put them in the ring, and then you just sit and collect data for a while. Until gradually the, you've started to look, you start to lose enough of those electrons and positrons that you're not getting enough collisions anymore. You stop, you dump them somewhere, you throw them in the wall. It makes it louder boom than that. And, and, and then you start again. You make another bunch of electrons, another bunch of positrons, you put them in, you wait. So it's a nice way to work. Um, it's relatively easy to do, um, but it has a couple of problems, which is uh, the reason we don't do this much, we're not planning to do anything like that too soon, which is that you're accelerating these things, of course. 
not just in terms of energy, but now you're accelerating because you're trying to turn them in a circle. And accelerating charged objects radiate energy. So you have two problems. First of all, you need, a, you need a magnetic field to steer them. For these guys, that's not such a big problem. But you're losing energy as they go around each turn. So you have to keep not only uh, steering them, but you also keep having to give them another kick every time they go around. And the problem is that the energy that you lose per turn goes like the boost factor to the fourth power. In other words, energy of, of the object over its mass, the fourth power. And then there's the one over the radius of the ring. For example, if I kept the same tunnel and got new magnets and tried to accelerate them to higher energies, the new magnets are needed to steer them more because to, to bend them in a ring, the um, magnetic field you need is going to be proportional to the radius of the ring. Sorry. If you want a beam energy E beam, you're going to need a big magnetic field um, or a big ring. On the other. Because that's basically just saying that, well, at higher energy, I need to turn them faster, so I need a stronger field to make the turn. But, you know, maybe I can just go out and buy some more powerful magnets, and now I can have more energy in the same ring. The problem is, you try to double the energy, you're increasing the loss rate by factor 16. So, if you want to build a higher energy E plus E minus collider, and you don't want to be losing all your energy each turn, which is going to break your power budget. These are practical things, right? We're talking large amounts of energy, significant fraction of the power budget goes into running this thing. You start losing energy every single turn that's comparable to the energy that's in the beam, you're going to go broke. You can't afford that. Not to mention the fact the environmental cost. So your only choice is to make a bigger ring if you're going to have higher energy. You need to turn them less. So you, that's, that's the way you do it. You, have a, you would have a bigger ring, you don't need such big magnetic fields, and also your loss rate goes down. And then you can afford to have somewhat bigger energy. Okay, but even so, if I build a ring that's three times or four times as big as the one I have, I still can't make the energy ten times as big. So we're running out of steam because of this problem. E plus E minus ring are simply not going to work forever. Maybe there'll be one more. It can be two more. But they're not easy to build. Tunnels are expensive. Not to mention an 80 kilometer tunnel, you gotta put a lot of stuff in. People do talk about an 80 kilometer to 100 kilometer tunnel in the future, and maybe it'll be a plus or minus machine. But this is not something we could do today. So, an E plus or minus storage room for getting the GDB scale out of the question. What's the other option? A linear collider. What are the disadvantages of that? Well, one obvious disadvantage is you make an electron bunch and you make a positron bunch, you throw them at each other, and that's it. You one shot. So you have to aim carefully. Can't afford to miss. And then you have to do it again. Immediately. You're constantly making positrons. An electron's not that hard to make. Positive you have to do something. They're not that hard to make. But, but you have to repeat this process. If I've stored this bunch in here, and they're going around a ring which is 27 kilometers around, they're colliding every 25 nanoseconds or so. I can't make electrons and positrons in bunches at a 25 nanosecond rate. So I'm going to have fewer collisions. So that's a problem. It's just hard to make enough of these things fast enough to get as many collisions as you want. So you're going to suffer from luminosity, that's one problem. It's hard to get the rate. Another problem is that you actually have to be able to accelerate these things to significant energy. Now that, um, the first attempt to do this was at SLAC, the, the so-called SLCs, SLC, Stanford Linear Collider, uh, which had a slightly weird design, which I won't bother to go through right now. But anyway, they were the first to attempt this, and they had an energy which was right at the Z mass. 
And it's a success, although not as much a success as they were hoping. It took them longer, they weren't as competitive with left as they were hoping to be. But it worked. It can be done. And people have designed more complicated, more powerful uh, such machines, and they go by names like ILC, the International Linear Collider. And the energy per, of, of the, the center mass energy that people talk about For the future, you know, 250 GB wouldn't be too hard, that's enough already to start making Higgs bosons. 1,000 GB is, takes a quite a long tunnel that can be done. That's sort of the range of the problem. If you want to make Higgs bosons now, this is not the way to go. Well, okay, it, today we know that actually this would be enough. But back in 2000, we didn't know, maybe the Higgs is a massive 500 GB. We will need the full energy, and we're not ready to build that. It's expensive. So, no one took seriously the possibility of building a machine like this for discovering things. That wasn't good. Okay, and um, uh, so that, that kind of does away for the present with this. And this is why we have proton based machines. Okay, any questions? Alright, so what are, the, what are the advantages and disadvantages of protons? Well, um, uh, I guess the first thing you would say is that um, one advantage is that n here is much bigger. If I have protons in a storage ring for the same amount of energy, uh, I, I have a factor of 10 to the 8 less uh, radiation. So, uh, did I say that? No, it's 10 to 12. It's, it's tiny. It's not a problem. So, so, so that's great. Okay, so, so, so for protons, this is no problem. Or antiprotons, of course. Um, now, what's the disadvantage? Well, the proton is complicated, and to get to the TeV scale, since the quarks inside the proton are the things that are really colliding, I'm not going to get the full energy of the proton in the collisions that make Higgs bosons. I'm going to get some fraction. So to go to the TeV scale, to look for the Higgs up to the TeV, I'm going to need a machine where the protons collide with energy quite a bit bigger than that, of order 10 TeV. To get TeV scale collisions, I need 10 TeV scale. So to get TeV particle collisions, I need 10 TeV proton proton collisions. Okay, so that then tells me I need a bigger magnetic field than I would need for a comparably plus and minus machine. Right? So I don't have this problem, but I've got to get higher energy, so therefore I need strong fields. And indeed, the limitation for a given tunnel. And the tunnel we want to use to save money is the same one from left hand, rather than building a new one. Well, okay, people did talk about building a new one. It's called the superconducting super collider. It's proposed, and uh, the people started to build it in the United States, then the United States Congress canceled it. It was expensive. Why was it expensive? Well, first of all, it was a big tunnel. Tunnels are expensive. But second of all, you needed these powerful magnets, and the magnets were superconducting, and they turned out to be twice as expensive as people projected they were going to be, and that pushed the budget up. And if you know about how budgets work, once you've got one thing that's big in the budget, that things get delayed, and the delays cause more overruns, and suddenly you're in good trouble. That was the real problem. At um, the Large Hammer Collider, they had an existing tunnel. They had to strip out all the equipment from left and put in new magnets, which were superconducting, had much more powerful fields. And it's the strength of the field that determines how much energy you have in the beam. So the magnets are everything. How can, can you turn those protons in this room? Okay, um, we'll, we'll come back to magnetics, magnets in a minute. The problem is that protons are complicated. All right, so, so, so a little bit of, uh, this is partly for me to learn something about what it is that you do and don't know. Uh, so it's a little quiz, but you're not getting great. By the way, uh, who actually needs to take this course for credit? 
Anyone? That makes my life easy. Okay, now this quiz is really for me. Okay, so I have, I have four true-false questions for you, and I just want to see who thinks uh, they know the answers. And I'm going to ask who thinks something is true and who thinks it's false, because I know that if I just ask how many people think such and such a thing is true, no one will raise their hand to anything. But you have to raise your hand one way or the other. Don't worry about being wrong, but it's a way again for you to understand what you know as opposed to what you think you know. Okay? So, um, pro Um Okay, um, are they made from three quarks? Um, uh, if one, the average momentum of the quark is about a third the momentum of the proton. The quarks are U and D, and four um, quarks are confined in the proton. and can't escape. Okay, true false. Number one, is it true? How many people say it's true? How many people say it's false? Okay, about half and half, good. Okay, number two. Uh, for those of you who said number one was true, is this what you expect? Yes, or good. how many people think it's true? How many people think it's false? <laughs> okay, that's interesting. All right. Um, number three, the quarks involved, if you, if you look at the proton, you look for its quarks, you're going to find out quarks and down quarks. How many people think that's true? How many people think it's false? Okay, I understand, especially since I'm seeing some cross correlations out here. <laughs> um, number four, quarks are confined to protons that can't come out. How many people think it's true? How many people think it's false? <laughs> Wait a second. Let's try that again. The parts are confined to protons that can't escape. How many people think it's true? How many people think it's false? Okay, a lot of people are really confused. Just... <laughs> Properly interpreted, they're all false. Okay, so we got some things to learn about protons. That's good. Right, so I will go through that. <laughs> Alright, so. Um, obviously, you can't understand what the LHC is doing, it's smashing protons together, unless you understand protons. You also can't understand why are we using protons and not protons and antiprotons. I mean, if I, if I smash two electrons together, it wouldn't be very interesting, right? Electron hits electron and they just bounce off, they don't, they're not going to annihilate anything. So if you really think a proton is made from quarks, why would you slam a proton against a proton? Would you need to slam a proton against an antiproton to get anything interesting to happen? Wow, okay, so clearly something else is going on. All right, so what is a proton? How do I think about it? It is certainly true that there is a sense in which it is... There is a sense in which it is a U, U, D, two up quarks and down quark uh, state. But the only sense in which that's true is it has the same quantum numbers as a U, U, D state. It has in it, additionally, all sorts of things that are flavor singlet, that is, they don't contribute to the flavor quantum numbers of proton. For example, it's got all sorts of gluons in it. How many? I don't know. They're constantly running into each other and changing. It's not a, it's not a concerned quantum number. And it's also got all sorts of quark and quark pairs in there. Because two of the gluons can run into each other and make a UU bar pair, or they can make a DD bar pair, or they can make an SS bar pair. There's strange quarks in the proton. Why not? So there's lots of gluons, and there's UU bar pairs, and then there's DD bar pairs, and there's strange quark pairs. For brief moments, there are even charm anti charm pairs and bottom anti bottom pairs in a sense, right? They get, they're, 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 those are really clearly virtual. They're just there for a moment, and they disappear. But they can be excited for brief instance. That's actually relevant for some of the phenomenology. But now you see the point. When I smash two protons together, I can get one of the quarks here to hit one of the antiquarks, or I can get one, two gluons to hit each other. 
In other words, a proton beam is, for the point of view of particle physics, it's a beam that's partly quarks, partly gluons, partly antiquarks. And so smashing two of those things together, I got all possible combinations of, of interactions with different probabilities, with different momentum impacts. Okay, so, so we've ruled out this one. Proton is not made from three quarks. It's three quarks plus lots and lots of quarks, many, many quark pairs of gluons. Uh, quarks are not just used in Ds. They can't be straight. Of course, they're mostly used in Ds, at least at high momentum, but low momentum, actually. We get lots of uh, different types. We'll get into that in more detail. Um, and it's not true that quarks carry about a third of momentum, uh, each carry a third of momentum proton, not just because there are lots of these quark anti quark pairs. These tend to be fairly low energy, but the gluons carry a lot of the energy. So, so this is not true. Okay, number four is a little more subtle. It's true that none of you have seen a quark. You probably haven't even seen an electron. You've seen an electron hit a screen. You've never seen a quark hit a screen, and you're never going to. But it's not really because the quarks can find the protons and can't escape. You have to be really careful about what you say in physics. Right? Be very precise with your statements. It's part about being very precise with your thinking. People say quarks are confined. They talk about quark confinement. If you go to your QCD class, people say quark confinement is one of the most important things that we know in nature. Well, oh, wait, wait a second. There is a very clear definition of what confinement means, and these quarks don't satisfy it. The definition of confinement would be, here's a proton, complicated object, and I grab one of the quarks, and I pull. And no matter how hard I pull, that quark will never come out. That would be a definition of confinement. What, in fact, would happen, physically, if I grab one of these quarks and I pull, what would happen? First, it would distort. Okay, there's my quark and everything else in here. What happens next? Keep pulling. Hmm? Well, so what, what precisely happens at the level of quarks and antiquarks? You create a pair. Why do you create a pair? What's, what's going on in here? Okay, so, so what happens if I have a strong electric field? You all know, if I take two capacitor plates, and I put a very strong electric field, and I keep cranking it up, something's going to happen. What is it? I'm going to create an electron positron pair. At some point, once the energy density is high enough, it's got to be really strong, but once the energy density is high enough, I'm going to start having enough energy in local regions that I can pop an electron and positron pair in a certain volume. I have enough energy in the field that making an electron positron pair, which reduces the field, is actually energetically favorable. And so, So a little pair will appear, and in fact, if I try to crank the field up too much, I'll produce lots of pairs, and those pairs will bring the field back down to sort of a critical value, which is the value beyond which you don't make these things. Well, we have a similar situation here. What, what's going on in here is that this quark has strong chromoelectric fields, these are gluon fields, which are trying to pull it back in. That's what's holding it in, it's a strong chromoelectric field. Well, if all the quarks were really heavy compared to the QCD scale, this field wouldn't be strong enough to make pairs. And so then, I would pull and I would pull and I would pull and I would get this very long tube, and it would be full of, it would be basically a, a, a flux tube, a tube of chromoelectric flux. But nowhere along that tube would that, would that field be strong enough, it would be basically a constant field. Nowhere would it be strong enough to make a quark anti quark pair. If the quarks were really heavy, then it would be true. You keep pulling, you keep pulling, you keep pulling, but you would not break the strength, break the slug strength. But because the up quark, the down quark, and the strange quark are light, there's no problem. You make this field, and it says, I don't, I don't like that. And it makes a quark. Anti-quark pair. 
which reduces the field. And the original quark you had pairs up with the new QR. And the old one, sorry, the, and, and the new quark you made pairs up with the old stuff, leaving you with the proton you started with, or maybe a neutron, or maybe something else, a lambda, something which has an up quark, a down quark, and whatever this new quark happens to be. It could be up, down, or strange. So I end up with Heim, or some other meson, and proton, or some other baryon. And so, this is false. You will never find a quark outside a hadron, that's true. But that's not the same statement as this. That's very important. When we make high energy quarks, they come out. We eventually observe the consequence of that. We'll come back to this a couple of times at some point. Okay, any questions about that? Good. So now we're going to talk about the LHC. We have two options. Three. One of them is obviously two. We can make a proton proton collider. We can make a proton anti proton collider. No one is going to bother to make an anti proton anti proton collider. By the <laughs> What are the advantages and disadvantages? The advantage of a proton anti proton collider is that you're going to more easily get quark anti quark annihilation at the highest possible energies. These guys do tend to carry a significant fraction. The significant is still relatively small. But they carry a significant fraction. We'll get into that in more detail. So quarks in the proton have more energy than the antiquarks on average. And so if you want the highest energy quark antiquark annihilation, you can go for proton antiquark. But you also want lots of collisions. And antiprotons are difficult to make. So the balance between whether it's better to have a larger fraction of your collisions to be QQR versus whether it's better just to have more collisions is something you have to calculate. And it turns out that for the energies which the large hadron collider or the, or the superconducting supercollider we're looking at, it was better to go with proton proton. It's also probably because of the way the Higgs is made, but we'll go back to that. By contrast, the Tevatron, which was the previous machine, working at about uh, a fifth the energy, six, uh, seven, um, that machine was a proton anti proton machine. So both have been done. There are pros and cons, but at the uh, LHC, the decision was proton proton. All right. What is the LHC? You probably all know most of this, but it's always good to review. Basics. Um, let's see if we can get the lighting situation a little better. And where's the light for this one? On the left side of the black On the left side of the black Okay, so don't be going to sleep. <laughs> so, um, how do you make a machine like the LHC? Well, first of all, uh, you start with smaller ones. Um, you have small accelerators which feed into larger accelerators which feed into larger accelerators. And these used to be your workhorses. They used to do experiments with these things. Now they're just feeders. Right, so you accelerate a bunch of protons, you then pipe them into the big ring going this way, or you pipe them into the big ring going that way, and then you accelerate them to the highest energies that you can get. Um, there are four dots here where uh, protons can be brought into collision, and in each of those dots there, are, there is a detector. So the ones we're going to talk about most are Atlas and CMS. Uh, I'll mention LHCB and LHCB just to pass it. If you look inside the tunnel, which is typically about 100 meters underground. Uh, here's the scale. You'll see these long blue tubes. Each one of these blue tubes is a magnet. Magnets are each about 15 meters long, I think. They're about, 1, about 1,200 of them, something like that. They're huge. Absolutely huge. Uh, and um, uh, now, if we cut through one of these magnets, slice through it, this is what we can see. Uh, this is a magnetic field. Uh, inside one of those tubes. And the important thing, the reason I'm showing you this is that throughout most of the LHC there are two beam pipes. One for the protons going clockwise, one for the protons going counterclockwise. And the magnetic field inside the magnet has been set up 
that the magnetic field here points this way, the magnetic field here points that way, and that way both, pair, both beams of protons can be steered as they need to be around the ring. If you had proton-antiproton, you would have a simple magnet. Right? A single magnetic direction would be enough to bend them the, the right in the same way. Sorry, in, into the same ring. But here you actually need the magnets uh, pointing, the magnetic fields pointing in opposite directions. This is all I want to say about the, the, the accelerator. This is, this is the meat. What about the, what about the detectors? Well, the detectors have two classes of designs at the LHC. Um, so most, so three of the four detectors are basically shaped like barrels, glorified barrels. The collision occurs right in the middle. CMS, Atlas, and Elise. Elise is designed for mainly uh, the collisions, which also occur one month a year with the Large Hadron Collider collides lead nuclei with each other. And so it's interested in looking at issues in the part of plasma that I'm not going to discuss here at all. Um, Alice and CMS can do that too. Alice and CMS both look like this, crudely. And then there's one other detector, LHCB, which looks kind of like that. Okay. Strictly speaking, it's a little more like this. But it's only one side, doesn't cover all of the directions, and the collision point is a bit of one end. Um, at some point, someone, either I or, or, or Gina, will probably explain why. The real question you should ask is why do we need this design? And uh, we'll come to that. People didn't used to do this. In the 1970s, there weren't machines like that. There wasn't anything like that. And it was only over time that people realized they needed something that has that kind of complete coverage. Essentially, you're trying to make sure that you measure almost everything that you can. Almost everything. And then there's some things you can't because you can't detect them at all. And there's some things you can't practically measure. But anything you can practically get at, you want to get. Whereas this machine, that's obviously not the goal. So that's LHCB. And these are the others. Okay, what about us and CMS do we look like? Well, here's cutaway drawings of the two. Uh, just to remind you of the scale, here's a human being relative to CMS. This is called the compact muon solenoid. It's compact compared to Atlas. There's a human being right there. Uh, Atlas is the size of, I don't know, 10 story building. So it's, it's, you know, again, the, the enormity is, uh, is pretty amazing. Of course, these things are packed full of electronics that makes incredibly precise measurements. It's hard to believe anybody can do this. Each of these uh, machines is really, each of these detectors is really an assembly of many sub detectors some of which have sub-sub-detectors. And each one is a purpose, which is part of what I want to go through. So there's a tracker in the middle, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, it has sub-pieces. There's an electromagnetic calorimeter. There's a hydronic calorimeter. And then there's a muon system. And those are the four basic sub-detectors of both CMS and Atlas. So um, let's take a look at just one quarter of CMS. So the collision point is here. Now let's look at a picture where the collision point is there. So now you can look at the scales involved. All right, so here's the tracker. It's about a meter this way and a few meters this way. There's the electromagnetic calorimeter, the hydraulic calorimeter. A superconducting coil, what's that for? All of these machines rely on having a magnetic field which points this way. And that's important for making certain measurements. We'll come back to this. So remember, the magnetic field inside here. And finally, up here is the muon system. Okay, and then to really get some of the particles that go at very small angles relative to the beam pipe, there's also additional equipment out here. You notice that there's going to be some regions where the tracker doesn't do any good some regions where you don't get certain types of energy measurements. Right. So it's, but, but at least from here all the way over, you're covering a lot of territory. Notice, by the way, everything's written in terms of a quantity eta. Eta is called pseudo-rapidity. So people, 
people work in terms of pseudo rapidity rather than angle for reasons that will become clear and are also perhaps already mentioned by, by, by Stefan Catani, uh, but, uh, but I'll make it clear uh, in a little while. Okay, what are all these subdetectors for? Well, it's harder to see than I would hope, but it should still be, I think, you would do. So, so let me go through this character. This is, the, this, is, this is the basic principle by which these machines work. So this is important to understand if you don't know it already. It's really the key. Why these subdetectors in that order? What is the purpose? Well, what can you actually hope to observe with these machines anyway? Collision occurs here. We're now looking through the barrel, through the wedge of the barrel. So, so we're looking at the barrel with the beam coming into the board, and we're looking at a little wedge of the, of the detector. So particles are produced here, they come flying out. Well, what do we hope to observe? Well, obviously, if something isn't stable or metastable, we can observe it. So we're only going to see the things that are stable or have relatively long lifetimes. What are those things? Well, one thing is a photon. Okay, a photon will travel in a straight line through the tracker. It will not do any ionization in the tracker, so you won't see anything. But the electromagnetic calorimeter is a material that's designed to take advantage of the fact When a photon comes near a nucleus, it can pair convert into an E plus and minus pair. Okay? So pair conversion will occur. What else happens after that? Well, either an electron or a positron that comes near an atom can ionize the atom pop an electron off, or it can radiate a photon. And those electrons or positrons can ionize or radiate, and the things that radiate can pair convert, and you get a cascade. And the idea is that the photon comes in with a bunch of energy, and by the time you're done, you have a lot of low energy electrons, positrons, and photons coming as a shot. And you collect those. And if you design your material correctly, if you've chosen the material wisely, the amount of electric signal that you get through this cascade, which is occurring in the electromagnetic calorimeter, it's occurring through all these electromagnetic interactions, the calorimeter means it's measuring energy, the amount of electrical signal you will get from this cascade is proportional to the energy of the photon. So that's how we measure the energy of the photon, which is measure how much charge is produced in this electromagnetic calorimeter by the shot, all of which is occurring through basic QED processes. Simple principle. How does this particle interact with matter and how can we use that to measure its energy? Alright, so again, photon, no track, and the energy that's deposited here tells you the energy and also where it is relative to the collision point tells you what direction the photon was pointing. This was going. So we know the direction and the energy of the photon, that's all we need. All right, good. How about the other part? What about electrons? Well, electrons will do a similar sort of thing in the electromagnetic calorimeter. They'll use shower, whose energy we can measure. But they will, in fact, ionize in planes of silicon, which make up the track. The tracker is made of various separated planes of silicon, and a charged particle passing through a piece of silicon will ionize some of the atoms in there, and that will create an electrical pulse. Pick up those pulses and connect the dots, and you can see where the electron went. But more generally, any charged particle going through a series of, of silicon uh, silicon planes will give you a nice little bit, a uh, nice little bit of signal that you can follow all the way through. On top of that, you put a magnetic field in here so that the electron will bend in the magnetic field by an amount that's uh, inversely proportional to its momentum. So by measuring the curvature, you see you get a measurement of the momentum. You get an additional redundant measurement of the energy here. And you see exactly where it came from by following this curve back and figuring, okay, that's what its initial momentum was after the collision. Any questions about that? Okay. That's photons and electrons. What else do we have? Um, we have muons. Muons have a finite lifetime, extend minus six seconds. Yeah, yeah. 
No, the cascade, the cascade just takes place because there's momentum going this way. Right? They let the photon carries momentum, and so all the particles that produce the cascade also have momentum going in that general direction. So the cascade just proceeds uh, under its own under its own momentum. Yeah, like to increase the cascade, maybe you want to... uh, I think in the current designs they don't need that. But you know what? Uh, that's a I don't think they need that in this design. It, it's a fair question, because it's some you're right, there are designs where you try to amplify the cascade. I don't think they have to amplify it, but I could be wrong. Alright, what about muons? Well muons if I put a muon here, you said an electron, there is some probability to ionize something, lose some energy. But in contrast, when an electron hits, comes near a nucleus and scatters off an electron, it's going to—it's like a, a ping pong ball hitting a ping pong ball. It's going to lose a substantial fraction of its energy. A muon being uh, hundreds of times heavier can still do this, but it won't lose much energy. So it just keeps going. So in contrast to an electron, which will cause this cascade, a muon will do a little bit of ionization, but it won't slow down. It won't lose any energy. It'll just keep going. And in fact, it'll go all the way through everything. All the way up to the other side of the thing. The muon is the only particle that will do this. So if you want to know if you have a muon, you look for something that makes it go all the way through everything. And you measure it on the outside. That's why the muon system's on the outside. And you have two chances to measure its momentum. You measure it because it makes a track just like an electron, whose curvature you can measure. And also, out here, in the muon system, which has got various detectors separated by, in the case of CMS, separated by lead, you can see how the track is curved. So you have two chances to measure the momentum there as well. Redundancy is always good. Sometimes you get a bad measurement here, but you get a good measurement here. So if you can make redundant measurements, you do. Uh, finally, hadrons. While charged hadrons will again give you a curved track, neutral hadrons will give you nothing in the tracker. And although it's drawn here a little bit inaccurately, they will tend, well, what, what's drawn here is a little bit of a simplification. What the what, what's drawn here is, is to say that they go right through the electromagnetic calendar, leaving nothing. That's generally not quite true. But what is true is that at least most of their energy is dumped into the hadron calendar, which is a material that has uh, relatively heavy nuclei. And therefore the probability that the hadrons that are coming in will interact with the nuclei of those atoms is relatively large. So instead of this picture, you have a neutron or a proton or, or a pion or any, any particle that can live long enough that it makes it out to the hadron orbiter, will hit a nucleus and shatter. And then now you have more neutrons and protons. So they hit more nuclei and they shatter. Now I have a a hadronic cascade. All right, so that's the principle there. So electrons and protons, so electrons and photons will dump all their energy in here. The hadrons will generally make it through, and they will dump their energy there. And the muons won't dump their energy anywhere. They'll make it all through. So that's why the electromagnetic calendar comes first, the hadron calendar second, and finally the muon system. And the tracker, ideally, is a completely passive device. If it were perfect, it would measure the tracker part without changing it. It would measure momentum, measure the direction, and you don't do anything to the part. You just leave it there so it can be measured more thoroughly. Now, these are destructive measurements. The electrons won't have that is, right? It's, it's lost all its energy. Same with the hadron here. So you want to do your passive measurements first, then your active destructive measurements second. Couldn't do the tracker afterwards, you wouldn't have the particle measure. That's it. That's the principle. Pretty easy. Of course, making work for nothing. Yeah. Uh, it seems like there's a change in the magnetic field that you do for the board. Right. If you've got a magnetic field coming uh, out of the board here, it's going to be going into the board there. Right. Well, just just the continuity of the magnetic field. Huh? Just the continuity of the magnetic field lines. Oh. It's a solenoid field. Roughly speaking, it's that simple. Um, Right, and of course, life is never as simple as they show you in the pictures, and of course, they won't talk. These are the basic principles. And again, Atlas and CMS work by the same principles. There are two, and only two, really important differences between Atlas and CMS, and most of the time they don't even matter very much, but I just want to alert you to them. One is that Atlas 
has a much larger, well, on Atlas is sort of more extended. It has a bigger hadron trial record, which means it's more, um, it, it's more effective at capturing the energy. It has, more, it has better precision. Um, it has a much bigger muon system. That's why it's such a big device. It extends out to here, roughly speaking. And instead of having detectors separated by lead, it has detectors separated by air. There's almost, never, almost no situations in which that's important, but I know of one where it's really important. Ask me later. The trackers are slightly different. And this doesn't matter that much in terms of how well they operate. Um, here's the tracker at CMS. And here's that eta variable, which I mentioned before. So you can track out to eta of 2.5, which you can see is out to maybe 15 degrees or so away from the beam pipe. Um, this part is strips of silicon. So you can see the particle going through and you give the strip, but that's the only information you get is passing the strip. The strips are aligned in clever ways so you get three dimensional information. In here is the powerhouse of the tracker. This, these are pixel detectors. This is made not of strips, but of individual dots, like your CCD count. The resolution, the size of the pixels in here are uh, hundreds of microns. They're tiny. Millions of pixels. So this is the place where the density of particles is the largest, with many more particles passing through there. And you want to measure things really precisely and nail them down, you'll see for some reasons why later. And so these pixel detectors are really important in the precision of the machine. Both Atlas and CMS have a pixel detector. Pixels in the interior, strips on the outside, and Atlas has something called the TRT, a transition radiation detector, so it doesn't have strips on the final part that is something else, which in some ways is less powerful and I don't think they found that useful. Whatever. Those are the detectors. Um, okay, good. Let's talk about things you actually do at these machines. What's a simple, interesting process you might imagine looking for? You might try to make a W boson. It used to be in the old days, it was hard to make W boson. So let's. Let's talk about that. So, so we'll use the fact that the proton has the properties that it does. And consider a process which, at, at its fundamental level, the quark level, is, let's say, something like this. Okay. Ud bar goes to the W, goes to the e plus nu. And, and you know that that's possible now that you know that it's in a proton. So, um, we've got our two protons coming in with some beam energy E. So, a formal momentum E, zero, zero, E, or let's uh, see, magnetization straight, yeah, P1. Say P1 and P2. And what's going to actually happen is inside one proton, there's an up quark, and inside the other proton, there's an anti down quark. And these are traveling the same direction as the protons, we're creating approximation. I mean, they're rattling around a little bit in there, but most of their momentum is either left or right. And um, on the other hand, we don't know what fraction of the energy of the proton they carry. So what we know is that P1 um, is x1 p1 mu, where x is between 0 and 1. Proportional to the proton's momentum, but it carries some fraction to a pretty good approximation. Similarly, p2 mu is x2 mu. Why not? I, 
I, I could be the posturon goes this way and the neutrino goes that way. Why in the center mass frame are they back to back? The center, right, exactly. The center mass frame of the protons is not the same as the center mass frame of the quarks. And this x1 is not equal to x2. So it may be, and it quite typically is, the up quark has a large momentum, the down quark, anti down quark may have a relatively low momentum, so the W is produced in motion, and the electron and the positron neutrino come out this way. That's crucially important. Okay, now there's some differential cross section which you can calculate. Um, and because this is a cross section for, well, let me, let me make a, a definition. By definition, a parton is any quark one or anti quark that's inside a proton. This is what we would call the partonic process that's going on, or the partonic collision that's going inside the proton proton. And we want the cross section for that, and anything that's partonic generally gets half. So this is the partonic differential cross-section for u d bar to go to w to go to e, e plus nu. And it's a function, of course, of the four momenta, the, elect the quark antiquark electron has a positron and neutrino momentum. Okay, now how do we calculate this? Well, either you already know, or you're certainly going to learn, or you've probably seen this before, but let me just remind you that the way you would calculate what you want, which is, what is the probability that I make a W boson in this way in a proton-proton collision, has to be related to this cross-section <coughs> by writing d sigma for PP to go to W plus dot 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 to go to positron neutrino plus dot 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 as a function of the proton momentum and the uh, positron and neutrino momentum. So these are capital P1 and capital P2. And these are little p3 and little p4. Is equal to an integral over the fractions that the fractions of the proton momenta that the quark and the antiquark can have. So we're integrating over all possible up quarks, which could have anything from very small to very large momentum relative to the proton momentum. The probability, also known as the part on distribution function, to find an up quark in the proton with momentum fraction x1. The probability to find an anti-down quark also in the proton, but now the other proton, with momentum fraction x2, times the partonic differential process. U d bar goes to w goes to e plus nu, no dot dot dot, of P1, P2, P3, P4. Where P1 is X1 capital P1, and P2 is X2 times capital P2. That's it. Those are the integrals we need to do. This is the fundamental formula for all partonic processes in a proton-proton machine, or any half -proton machine. You integrate over the probabilities to find the particles you want inside those two protons with the probabilities to find them against the cross section for the partonic process that you're interested in. And notice that there are these dot 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 things over here. What is that? It's what remains from the proton. It's what, sorry? It's what remains from the, the, the colliding proton. Critically important, there was more stuff than just an up part here, right? There's all the other, the other parts, the gluons, etc. All that stuff has to go somewhere. Two protons can't make a W plus, that doesn't conserve charge. There has to be some other charged stuff, and indeed it's going to be in general a very large number of hadrons that get produced in the smashing of two protons, this incredibly large energy. So the protons smash together, you make a W in there, and the whole thing shatters. And a huge number of atoms go flying, most of them down the B pipe. 
You don't even measure them. Others go near the beam with relatively low momentum, relative, trans, relatively low momentum transverse to the beam. So stuff goes flying everywhere, mostly, not literally everywhere distributed spherically, but everywhere sort of dis 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 distributed cylindrically. It's mostly going down the beam. All right, so what does it look like? There it is, folks. That is W production. So what do we see here? Um, what do we see here? Everything here has an interpretation. By the time you're done with this class, you'll be able to identify every single thing you see. So one thing you see is that, followed by this. What might that be? Well, that is a rather straight track. This is the tracker of Atlas. This is the electromagnetic calorimeter of Atlas. Hydronic calorimeter starts out here. This is something that's clearly either a photon or an electron or a positron. It's left the track, so it's not a photon. It's hard to see the curvature here. It is very slightly curved. The fact that the curvature is hard to see tells you this has high momentum. This is a high momentum electron. Consistent with BBB, I don't know, 40 GV or so, half the W mass roughly. There's nothing on the other side. Clearly, the momentum over here is not balanced by anything. Well, the beam came in this way. The beams came in this way. The total momentum transverse to the beams was zero. And it's conserved. So, if there's momentum going this way after the collision, there's something going that way, you haven't observed it. What do you think it is? Well, it's a neutrino or an anti-neutrino, most likely. It could be particle of dark matter or something else. But at least within the particles we know, it's, it's a neutrino or anti-neutrino. So that is consistent with having made positron, neutrino, or electron, neutrino, I don't know which here. Um, plus dot, dot, dot. And this is some of the dot, dot, dot. This is some of the so-called underlying event. This is the rest of the collision. Most of these are probably pions. There may be a few cans in there. Pions and cans live long enough that you can observe them. Maybe a proton or an antiproton. Obviously, there may be neutrinos, in, sorry, uh, neutrons in there as well, but you're not going to see them as tracks. Now, if they're bending this much, it tells you their momentum is relatively low. Most of these particles probably have momentum of a GeV or so, uh, two, two, three GeV. There are even more that they haven't even drawn. There's probably lots of particles that are spinning around in here with momenta of a couple hundred MeV. So they, they generally only draw for you the ones that have substantial momentum. If they're curving a lot, they're not really that uh, high momentum in the first place. Or in the language, uh, particle physicists, these are soft particles, and this is the hard one you're interested in. Low momentum, high momentum. So sometimes they don't even draw these at all. And here is a view from the side. Same event. Here's the collision point. There's our electron. You can barely see, if you're standing where I am, you can barely see that there's some energy deposited here in the electromagnetic converter. And then these are atoms going in all sorts of directions. You see, they're not entirely random, some of them are a little bit jammy. They look like they're organizing in the sprays. And then there are lots of particles that aren't even drawn. They're going this way, spinning around like this, going down a beam pipe. Where did the neutrino go? I don't know exactly. I know it went off this way. It might have gone off this way, or it might have gone off this way, or it might have gone off that way. I don't know the direction of the <clears throat> neutrino's momentum along the beam pipe. I can't measure that. Why not? <coughs> Why can't I use momentum conservation to figure out what the neutrino's momentum might have been? I use momentum conservation to figure out the neutrino must have gone off this way. Why can't I do a similar thing here? Maybe, again, it's roughly in this direction, but how do I, why can't I figure out if it went this way or that? What's the problem? Because of the center of mass. I mean, uh, the center of mass of the two products is not the same of the two forces. So that, that's correct, but why can't I just figure that out by measuring everything? That is to say, the total momentum of the collision has to be conserved. So if the only thing I missed was the neutrino, I should be able to figure it out. So you're right, I don't know it because of the, of the boost. 
but I also don't know it because I don't know, I don't measure the total momentum or the total energy. The momentum along this direction is affected by the fact that there are hadrons that were produced in the, in the collision. Part of the underlying event is going down the beam pipe. I can't measure it. Very important. So we cannot use momentum conservation at this type of machine along the beam pipe. Nor can we use energy conservation because a significant fraction of the proton proton energy goes down the beam pipe unmeasurably. So the only momentum conservation rules that we can use for these machines are transverse momentum, momentum transverse to the beam. We only get two conservation laws, not four. That's a disadvantage relative to an E plus and minus machine. You get all four. Just simply the inability to make the measurement that you need to make. Any other questions about that? Okay, good, I got a few more minutes. Um, all this crap you're not interested in, the soft particles in each collision. If you want to get enough collisions to actually make enough Higgs bosons and look for supersymmetric particles and really do the best measurements you can, turns out that when you're sending, oh, this is something I left out, I should have said. So I mentioned, when I, when I was talking about E plus and minus machines, I mentioned that you send bunches of electrons around once with one way and you send bunches of positrons around the other way. Well, they do the same thing at the LHC. There are bunches of protons. Protons are not a continuous beam. There are hundreds or even over a thousand bunches arranged around uh, going clockwise and another thousand bunches going counterclockwise. Each bunch has around 10 to the 11, 10 to the 11 protons. Something's bugging me, I'm losing factor of 10. There, there, are about 10 of the 50, there should be about 10 of the 15 protons total in the ring at a time, when, they, when it's fully loaded. I might have, I'm, I'm, there's some 10 I'm not losing, but anyway, it's, it's of that level, it's huge number. And the spacing of the bunches is set to align with the timing of the machine, which has radio frequency, it has to be tuned, and it's to 25 nanoseconds. And, um, the detectors are also designed to be repeating 25 nanoseconds. They actually be 50 nanoseconds for the last couple of years, 25 nanoseconds in the design. So you can't put more bunches in there, you have too many collisions. The bunches have to be every 25 nanoseconds, cross, they have to be crossing every 25 nanoseconds, you can't make it faster. If you want more collisions, you have to have more collisions than one every time two bunches cross. So what I said, 3 plus and minus, which is, well, you arrange the bunches so that when they pass through each other, they're going to pass through each other again and again, each time they pass through, each time they bunch cross, you get a order one collision. Well, that's sort of the ideal situation. But actually, they've been doing five, six for years, and uh, in the LHC, they've pushed it now to 20. It's going to go up. And the collision region is sort of a few centimeters wide. And this is a bunch crossing, where simultaneously there were 25, at least, proton-proton collisions that all occurred at the same essential instant. All measured at the same time, all measured by the detector at the same time. And somewhere in there, there were two muons that came from the Z-Bone Center. They are marked in nice color. And unfortunately, the color is a lot easier to see on my screen because there's something wrong with the projector. But each of the lines here that are coming from a point is from one collision. And the point of showing you this is, this is how good those detectors are. They can do this. 25 collisions can go on at once, and they can measure every single track that comes out and figure out which vertex it came from. They don't have too many straight tracks. They have some. And that's critically important, because if you want to say, well, here was a Z-Bose that was produced, and I wonder what else was produced along with it, you don't want to get confused about stuff that was produced over here. You want to say, ah, let's focus on all the tracks that come from that collision. This is called pile, where you have multiple collisions at the same time. In fact, it's called in-time pile, where all the collisions are from a single bunch crossing. So something called out-of-time pile, which is all the debris from all these collisions wanders around 
for longer than 25 nanoseconds and is still bouncing around inside the detector. It uses the heck out of it. The more collisions you have, the more of that crap you have. So, the experimenters have to deal with this. And the more luminosity they get, the more pile up they get, the more they have to, the more compromises and clever tricks they need. They're, they're often good. Now, why can they do this? This will be my final point. I'll start here next time. The reason they can do this is the following extremely important and terrifying graph. This is, in a sense, encapsulates why LHC physics is so difficult. And it's hard to read, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Whoops, I didn't mean to advance. Okay. This is showing the collision rate. Ignore the stuff on this side. For now. This is showing collision rates as cross sections in barns, or mind you, the barn is, and as a collision rate in hertz. How many collisions per year when they're running at the luminosity that they're going to be? Uh, they're already pretty close to that, and also when they go up to 14 TeV. So the actual numbers, the 7 TeV collider, are a little bit lower, but not much. What's a barn? Uh, a barn is 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. Proton um, is, wait, sorry, 10 to the minus, yeah, 10 to the minus 24. Um, what's the radius of protons? 10 to the minus 15 meters, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. Um, if you collide two protons, roughly speaking, you expect their cross section is, you know, avoiding the geometric cross section. Proton is a complicated, fat, strongly interacting object. If two protons get within the geometric cross section, you expect they hit each other. So, roughly speaking, you would expect, given that a proton has an area that is pi times 10 minus uh, 13 centimeters squared, that the collision uh, cross section for two protons would be a border of, of maybe a tenth of a bar. And it is. This is a tenth of a barn right here. The inelastic cross section, which is the probability they hit and they break and something gets excited, is just a little smaller than that. The total cross section is about twice that. So the total cross section is right about here. Most collisions between two protons are just glancing blows that make junk. They make what's known as a minimum bias event. So the history of the minimum bias, I won't tell you now. But a minimum bias event is just another word for an event where almost nothing happened. You just broke the proton into maybe two or three hadrons. It's a glancing blow, not much. It's basically a soft, that is a low transverse momentum event. Nothing interesting happens as far as any partons making something heavy or doing anything interesting. That is the vast majority of collisions. You don't even start to make bottom quarks through the process, let's say, glue, glue goes to two bottom parts. Bottom parts have a mass of 5 GeV. These are 14 TeV collisions. You don't even start to make bottom parts before you pay a price of a factor of a few hundred. Okay. Millibars. Fraction of millibars. What's the probability you make a W boson, as I've shown there? You're down at cross sections of a tenth of a micro or 100 nanobars. To be compared, with 100 milliwatts. One in 10 to the 6 the proton proton collisions makes a W. And another factor of 10 if you actually want to make a lepton on the decay. So that is why, for example, you can afford to have 25 collisions at the same time. Because the probability that two of them are interesting is really small. You're going to have one interesting one and 24 of them that are like this, that are the majority, minimum bias, just make a few particles, no, nothing just happen. That's why you can. And the fact that you need 10 to the 6 of them to make W's, and the Higgs well sign is off the screen down to 10 to the minus 12, is why you have to. Okay, and we'll start there next time.